Hi everyone and welcome to our session on the connections between climate change, migration and COVID-19. I want to begin quickly by saying something about myself and the organisation that I work for. So I work for Climate Outreach and we are an organisation that is focused on the public communication and understanding of climate change. I lead our work on the connections between climate change and migration, which is focused firstly on gaining a better understanding of what the connections are between climate change and the movement of people, and then working with refugee and migration rights organisations to help them become advocates in the climate change space and understand what climate change will mean for them as organisations and the people that they work with and represent. Understandably, the new pandemic that we are currently experiencing has huge implications for people who are already displaced by climate change impacts or people who are at risk of displacement in the future due to climate change. And what we wanted to do with this session is to begin to explore how these existing patterns of migration and displacement that are driven by climate change are further impacted by the pandemic that the world is currently experiencing. So what we're going to do in this session is look firstly at the links between climate change and migration and then explore how these three issues, climate, the movement of people and COVID-19, potentially interact with each other and the vulnerabilities that that may cause for people who are on the move. I'm going to start by giving a quick outline of the structure of the session, just so that you've got some understanding of what we're going to be covering and the order that we're going to be covering things in. So the first thing that we're going to do is examine the ways in which climate change impacts are potentially driving or shifting, altering patterns of climate linked migration and displacement. We're going to do this initially without focusing very much on the additional connection to coronavirus. We're just going to gain a shared understanding of how the uh, issues of climate change and migration are connected. After that, we're then going to bring in this additional factor of the pandemic of coronavirus, and we're going to look at how these patterns are additionally impacted, how it is that existing patterns of migration and displacement then relate to the current pandemic. We'll look at what that means for people who are already on the move or who might be displaced in the future. And there are two key contexts that we're going to look at around people who are displaced during sudden climate change events and people who have migrated in the context of slowly unfolding events like drought in order to find work. And we're going to explore how those two contexts are altered by the pandemic. Finally, we're going to look at some of the policy and finance options for dealing with this. We're going to look at what interventions could potentially be made to improve the welfare and livelihood and well-being of people who find themselves caught in between these three issues. People who find themselves affected firstly by climate linked migration and then also find themselves in a situation where they are additionally coping with living through the coronavirus pandemic. Towards the end of the session, hopefully we will have some time for your questions and I will do my best to answer those when we get to the end of the session. So let's move on. As I said, the first thing that we're going to do is explore how climate change impacts are affecting patterns of human movement, how existing climate change impacts, things like droughts, hurricane strikes, typhoons, flash flooding, how all of these climate change impacts are shifting patterns of human migration, how they are altering patterns of human movement across the world. And to do that, we need to begin by examining some of the key concepts and ideas that help us understand, firstly, how migration works, and then secondly, how climate change impacts take place, and then finally, how these things impact each other to create these patterns of climate-linked migration and displacement. The first distinction that we need to make is this difference between migration and displacement. And very simply, when we use this distinction, we mean that migration is a form of human movement which has more choice, it has more freedom. When we talk about people engaging in migration, in this context, what we mean is people who have moved with some degree of choice, with some agency, 
They haven't been forced to move. Their migration has essentially been a decision rather than something that they had no choice about at all. When we say displacement, we mean the opposite. We mean people who have been forced to move. They haven't really had any meaningful choice about when they move or where they move. Their movement has simply been a matter of ensuring their immediate survival. They are essentially fleeing some kind of disaster. And this is a really important distinction, migration versus displacement. Now, of course, there are shades in between these two distinctions. But if we imagine a continuum with migration at one end and displacement at the other, we can then place various various different experiences and episodes of human movement along this continuum in order to gain a sense of whether the people moving have been doing so freely, out of choice, or whether they have been forced to move in order to survive. So that's the first key distinction. And we'll be coming back to that distinction throughout the whole session. So it's a really important one to keep in mind as we move forward. The second distinction we need to make is between internal versus cross-border movement. Very simply, this means whether someone has moved within their own country, whether they've moved from one place within their own country to another place, or whether they have crossed an international border and left their country of origin or country of residence and moved to another country. Again, this is a distinction that we'll be coming back to over the session, and it's one of the really key distinctions that we need to keep in mind when we're thinking about how climate change drives migration and displacement. I want to move on now to looking very briefly at a key distinction that we make when we're thinking about climate change impacts. And this is between slow onset and rapid onset events. And what we mean here is the difference between climate change events, climate driven impacts that unfold very slowly. And in this context, we mean things like sea level rise, which unfolds over a number of decades or even longer, and drought, which unfolds over months or potentially years. And we're making a distinction between those slowly unfolding events and things that happen much more quickly. So when we talk about rapid onset events, we mean things like typhoon strikes and hurricane strikes, things that happen with very little warning, take place over a number of days, and then, um, and, but then stop leaving the aftermath to be dealt with by the people who are affected by it. And this is a really key distinction. And the reason that it's a key distinction when we're thinking about the connections between climate change and human movement is that these kinds of events create very different patterns of human movement. Slow onset events like sea level rise and drought create certain distinctive patterns of human mobility. Whereas rapid onset events like flash floods, typhoons and hurricanes create very different patterns of human movement. So that's why we're bringing that distinction in right at the beginning. So what are the key patterns of migration and displacement that are connected to climate change? The first one that we're going to look at is internal displacement linked to suddenly unfolding climate change events. And what we mean here is people moving within their own country, in general moving short distances, and essentially fleeing rapidly unfolding disasters like hurricane strikes, typhoon strikes and floods. In general, these people tend not to move across international borders and they tend to move short distances in response to the immediate crisis, to the immediate disaster that they are facing. The second key pattern of mobility is internal migration. So people moving with perhaps a little more agency, perhaps a bit more freedom about where and when they move. And this in general is a pattern of, of mobility that unfolds in response to more slowly unfolding disease. In these situations, what we find is people moving in order to find work as the climate change impact, for example, drought, has eroded their ability to make a livelihood, has destroyed their ability to work, usually in agriculture, and people move from rural areas into cities in order to find alternative jobs. So those are the two key patterns of climate-linked migration, climate-linked mobility. Um, Firstly, those are the two most prevalent, but they're also the two that over the course of this session we are going to explore in more depth 
and try to understand how both of these two patterns of internal displacement and then of internal migration connected to slowly unfolding disasters, how those interact with COVID-19, interact with the pandemic that the world is now facing. So this brings us to the second part of the session. We're going to begin looking in more depth at these two key contexts. And we're going to start by examining the internal displacement context uh, first and then move on to looking at internal migration. So <clears throat> what we're really talking about here is internal movement, people fleeing without crossing international borders, fleeing in the context of suddenly unfolding disasters. The key drivers of this that I want to examine now, these are by no means the only drivers of this kind of internal displacement. Obviously, people flee conflict, violence, human rights violations, and they very often flee within their own country in these situations too. But what we want to examine here, what I want to focus our attention on, is the, is, is the disasters, the climate and weather related disasters that can drive this kind of displacement. And key amongst these, I think, for our purposes today are thinking about hurricanes and typhoons, so, so various types of tropical storms, and flash flooding. And what we're really thinking about here is the kinds of mobility, in this case, displacement, that these kinds of sudden events create. So the first thing we need to understand is that this form of displacement is usually short distance. And the simple reason for this is that when people are fleeing sudden disasters, they are moving the shortest distance possible in order to protect themselves, in order to survive. People don't want to move further than they have to, so it is really a case of getting out of the immediate impact zone of the disaster to somewhere safe. People don't feel the need to move further than that. In general, people who are displaced in this context don't want to go further than they absolutely have to. Because of that, this pattern of displacement is usually internal. People usually do this without crossing an international border. Of course, there are a few exceptions to this where people are already located near to an international border and they cross it in the immediate aftermath of the disaster. But by and large, what we're talking about here is climate and weather related disasters that are driving short distance internal displacement. During these kinds of events, it's also very common that various kinds of evacuation are, are organized either by government, city authorities or the military. So many people who move in this context, many people who are displaced, go from one place to another during the aftermath of a disaster are actually part of organized evacuations. Many move on their own in an ad hoc manner, but many are also relocated as part of evacuation plans. So that gives you a sense of the kind of mobility, the kind of displacement that is taking place in the aftermath of these disasters. In general, this kind of displacement tends to be temporary. People don't move permanently. Quite understandably, people want to return to be part of the reconstruction efforts, to get their lives back on track, to rebuild their businesses and to get everything back to normal as soon as they possibly can. So this kind of displacement is very often short term <clears throat> with people attempting to return almost as soon as it is safe and sometimes even returning before it is actually technically safe to do so. But in general, the key thing to remember here is that this isn't usually creating permanent um, human movement. It's creating internal, short distance and temporary displacement with people attempting to return to their homes and businesses, usually as soon as possible. Roughly 20 million people a year are forced to move in this manner. So last year, uh, I think just less than 15 million people were displaced by climate and weather related weather related disasters. The year before that, it was actually much higher, but roughly a global average for the number of people who are displaced every year in these kinds of situations is roughly 20 million. So it's a huge, huge number of people who are being displaced in, in this context, a, a number of people that is similar to, you know, some of the some of the biggest cities on the planet. It's like 
twice the number of people as live in London, for example, being displaced every year by climate and weather related disasters. And the reason that we're focusing on this now is because throughout 2020, a huge amount of that displacement, a huge percentage of, of the 20 million or so people who are likely to be displaced by those climate and weather related events this year will face that displacement in the wider context of a global pandemic. And that raises the question, how will their experience of displacement be different to people who have been displaced in this way before? How will city authorities, governments and aid agencies have to cope differently and address this displacement differently because this year it is taking place in the context of coronavirus? And that's what I want to examine next. So the first connection that I want to make between this pattern of climate weather driven displacement and coronavirus is the tension between the need to flee and various kinds of lockdown and distancing measures that may be in place. I think it's inevitable that at some point a disaster that would usually create widespread displacement will hit a location that is in some kind of enforced lockdown. People will inevitably attempt to flee the disaster and authorities will have to make a very difficult decision about how they deal with this. For example, will they allow people to flee? Will they try to control people moving out of a particular city and into other locations? Will they continue to attempt to force enforce a lockdown even as the weather related event like a flood or a hurricane strike means that people need to leave. I think that there is real potential here for things to become extremely confusing, fraught and potentially violent as people are trying to flee and potentially city authorities, government authorities are trying to continue to enforce a lockdown. So I think it's really key that we just highlight this potential conflict between these two things now, because I think it's inevitable that at some point over 2020, we will, you know, the world will see a, a climate driven event, a, a sudden disaster of some sort, and then the collision of people's desire, completely understandable desire to remove themselves as quickly as possible from the disaster zone and that coming into tension with potentially the authorities wish to keep people put in order to prevent the spread of coronavirus. So I think there is a real tension there between people's need to remove themselves from harm's way and the need to maintain various forms of lockdown, social distancing, and various measures that are designed to contain coronavirus. At some point, climate-driven events will create a tension between those two things. The second key issue is that evacuation becomes much, much more difficult. What you can see there, the photo on the left, is hundreds or potentially even thousands of people um, taking part in an evacuation that was organized in the Philippines in the aftermath of Typhoon Haiyan in 2013. And I think what, what's clear from that photo and what's clear from our you know, common understanding of what evacuation entails is that people are very often um, moved using various forms of public transport and mass transit. Um, and those are very often extremely crowded people are forced onto uh, planes, buses and trains in order to get them out of harm's way. And in that situation, we can see that it would be very, very difficult to maintain the social distancing measures which are currently being used in order to try and contain coronavirus. So again, we have another issue, another, another part of this pattern of of climate driven displacement in which the, the, the movement that is needed, okay, the movement that is needed in order to get people out of harm's way essentially is in tension with the various forms of lockdown or social distancing that are needed to contain the virus.
and that will present very, very difficult situations for obviously for everyone involved, but also difficult and complicated decisions for emergency planners and city authorities and governments as they attempt to balance the need of getting people out of harm's way and containing the spread of the virus. The final issue uh, when we're thinking about this pattern of disaster displacement is around temporary shelters and camps. Um, the photo you can see there on the left is the inside of the New Orleans Superdome. And just after Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, um, there were approximately uh, 20,000 people camped out in, in the Superdome, either because their homes had been destroyed by Hurricane Katrina and they'd fled, or because they'd gone there um, hoping to essentially get out of the way of the hurricane as it approached. But one way or another, um, in the days immediately after Hurricane Katrina, there were there were 20,000 people camped in um, in the Superdome, which is, is essentially a it's, a it's a sports venue. Now, what we can see there is clearly a scenario which is <clears throat> absolutely necessary for the people who are fleeing. It was a vital part of their survival, you know, difficult as that as it was being camped there. But what we can also see is that that is a situation which essentially is um, ideal for the spread of coronavirus. It's a situation in which potentially many people could be infected with COVID-19 because they have been forced into cramped living quarters like that. So what we're seeing here, what we're doing here is building up a picture which I think worryingly points to the fact that a number of different things that always happen in episodes of disaster displacement will lead to coronavirus potentially spreading more readily. And those are evacuation, you know, moving lots and lots of people on, on systems of mass transit and bringing them into uh, close contact with each other, periods of extended um, temporary shelter in municipal facilities, gyms, sports centres, school halls, where potentially you've got hundreds or thousands of people all living in close quarters. Again, potentially um, a situation in, in which it's very easy for coronavirus to spread. And then finally, this question that will face um, municipal authorities and governments regarding whether or not to attempt to enforce lockdowns even when people are trying to flee. So what I'm trying to do here is, is build up a picture of the way that potentially um, climate change, these climate-driven disasters, displacement and coronavirus create a situation which is potentially even more serious than it usually is. What I want to conclude by saying is that I think it's very likely that one of the key things that will prevent some countries or some regions within countries, um, what will prevent them from containing coronavirus, what will prevent them from um, stopping it spreading, is, is the fact that they will also face these episodes of climate and weather driven displacement during 2020. So I think what we need to recognize is that, of course, there are multiple reasons at the moment why some countries are dealing with coronavirus better than others. Some of them have more resources. They're better able to deploy those resources and, and, and prevent the spread of, of disease. But throughout 2020, I think what we will also see is that some countries who suffer the worst impacts of climate change will will encounter a situation where it is those climate change impacts and the displacement that those climate change impacts create, which additionally hampers them in, in preventing the spread of COVID-19. I want to move on now to looking at the second key context that we're going to examine. So we're going to move on from thinking about sudden internal displacement caused by things like flooding and hurricanes. And we're going to look at patterns that are more like migration where people are moving with a little bit more agency and a little bit more choice 
And they're moving very often in the context of slowly unfolding events rather than rapid events. So they're moving in the context of things like drought, uh, sea level rise and desertification. And very frequently they're moving in order to find work after their livelihoods have been destroyed or eroded by disasters like drought. So one of the key impacts of climate change is an increase in the length and severity of droughts. And when this happens, agriculture is obviously very badly affected. It tends to mean that agricultural yields decline and with that, obviously, farming income shrinks as well. When this happens, people obviously look for alternative work. They look for a way of replacing the farming income which they have lost, which has been lost to them because of the decreasing yields resulting from the drought. Now, it's very common that when people look for this replacement work, when people look for an alternative job, they are looking for one outside of the agricultural sector. They're looking for one they're looking for a job that hasn't been impacted by the presence of the drought. And very often this means leaving the rural area in which they have lived and moving to a city in order to find some other form of non-agricultural work. So what this does is create a pattern of migration, of labour migration, of migration of people looking for jobs, moving from rural areas and into cities. Again, this tends to be a pattern of short distance movement. What we're talking about here is people moving from a rural area, often to the nearest city where that kind of work is available, to the nearest location where they can find an alternative job. This is because migration always comes with costs and risks. And in general, people want to minimize those by moving the shortest distance possible. They also don't want to move further than they absolutely have to from their homes and families. In general, this pattern of migration tends to be individual. We're talking about one or two household members moving at a time. We're not talking about entire towns or villages suddenly moving altogether. It's a pattern of migration that also tends to be seasonal and temporary. So what we see is people moving uh, during the quiet parts of the agricultural calendar and then returning during the busier parts. We see people moving when drought begins to bite, but then returning if the drought alleviates. Essentially, what we're seeing here is people using migration, using migration from rural areas to cities and back again as a way of trying to sustain and balance their household income, as a way of maintaining household income as far as possible at normal levels, even during a drought. Essentially, they're using labour migration, they're using working in cities as a way of coping with drought. This achieves several really important things. The first one is it achieves a level of financial security for the migrants themselves, for the people who are moving. Their possibility of working in the rural area in agriculture has been taken away by the drought or greatly reduced by the drought. So by moving and finding work, they are securing their own livelihood, their own income, and, and hopefully improving their welfare as well. But it also does several other really important things. Most migrants who move in this context send money back to the household that they have left. That's called remittances. And they send a percentage of their salary back home. Now, this does something really important in the context of a drought. So if you remember, what we know is that the household who have stayed behind are still dealing with the impacts of the drought. Their livelihood continues to be eroded by the drought. But the remittances that the household member who has migrated is sending home insulates them to some extent against the worst impacts of the drought. As that household's income from farming declines, luckily, in some cases, they are receiving remittance payments from a member of their household who has migrated to find work somewhere else. So it's securing the livelihood of the person who's moved, 
but it is also helping to secure the livelihood and to some extent the financial stability of the household that they have left from. So it does, it does a number of important things. Finally, there is some evidence that when we see this pattern of rural to urban migration, remittances being sent back to rural farming areas, what we can see is that sometimes those remittance payments and that flow of money is being used for ad hoc community scale climate change adaptation. And what we mean is, for example, the family that has remained at home deploying some of that remittance money to do things like improve the irrigation on the farm or invest the money in diversifying out of agriculture and into other fields which are not as impacted by drought. So we've actually in some ways got a really positive pattern of financial flows here where an individual migrant is securing a livelihood for, for themselves. The remittance payments that they're sending home are helping insulate the rural family they've left from the drought that they are experiencing. And finally, by investing those remittance payments, the family in the rural area may even be able to begin to adapt to climate change impacts or move away from farming to some extent as drought in that area becomes worse. Now, that isn't to say that this is a positive experience universally. Even when people move within their own country, even when people migrate internally, they still face discrimination, they still face human, human rights violations. It's very common that people who move from rural areas into cities are often um, in the worst accommodation, potentially living in areas that are equally but differently exposed to other kinds of climate change impacts, living in informal settlements with potentially not very good access to healthcare. It's also the case that sometimes people are moving when they are actually very young. We have um, examples of children and teenagers moving in order to find work in cities, and they are therefore exposed additionally to various kinds of exploitation and potentially abuse. So this isn't, um, this isn't a strategy, this isn't a livelihood strategy which is without risk. It potentially has huge risks for the, for the migrants who take part in it. So I think it's important not to see it as some kind of panacea. But nonetheless, what we can see here is a situation in which migrants are moving. Yes, they're taking risks, but it is helping them cope with some of the worst impacts of climate change. So what I want to do now is try and explore how this pattern of mobility, how this pattern of internal rural to urban migration is potentially complicated by COVID-19, by the coronavirus. What we're seeing across the world is urban economies going into lockdown. So in order to try to prevent the spread of coronavirus, Many, many cities and in fact whole countries are bringing in various lockdown measures which require people to stay at home. The consequence of this is that many, many thousands of people can't work. It is either the case that, um, that the business that they work for has simply closed down due to the lockdown measures or they can't get to work and therefore they're no longer being paid by the employer. So as urban, urban centers go into lockdown, the economies in those urban centers essentially go into hibernation or collapse. And the consequence is that the people who worked in those sectors are then out of work. What this means for people who have migrated into cities from rural areas, perhaps driven by drought, perhaps driven by something else, is that they then face a very, very difficult situation they have to decide either to try and find another way to survive in the city, to try and find another job, to try and find some other way to get by, or they may try to return to the rural area they've migrated from, potentially taking them back into an extremely climate vulnerable area, back into an area that has perhaps being affected by drought, sea level rise, or is vulnerable to some other climate change impact, which they were attempting to move away from in the first place. There is also a global economic connection here 
across across the world, we've seen lockdown also bring um, consumption in many ways to a halt. So as lockdown measures have been brought into place, people have basically stopped going shopping for various things. High streets have been shuttered. People are no longer going shopping at the weekends. People aren't buying clothes. They aren't buying electronics, partly because those shops in many cities across the world, in many countries are simply closed. They're simply not open, but also because as we approach the economic disruption or as we find ourselves in the middle of the economic disruption created by coronavirus, people stop spending money. They attempt to save money rather than spend it. They want to try and buffer themselves from potential job losses further down the line. And the consequence is they spend less, they buy less, they consume less. What that means is that orders are not being placed for garments for electronics, basically the things that are very often manufactured in the cities of the developing world are no longer needed in the quantities that they were even last month. The consequence of that is obviously that huge numbers of people who work in the garment industry, in electronics, in other forms of manufacturing, making things for export are being laid off in huge numbers. Again, they face a similar choice. They will either have to find another way of surviving in the city or they may return to the rural area that they migrated from in the first place. So this does several really negative things to this livelihood strategy. Firstly, it removes the individual financial security of the migrant. The person who has moved in order to escape drought or escape sea level rise and find work in a city now finds themselves without the security of that job. They're unemployed. But because they're no longer earning, they are also no longer sending remittances back to the family, back to the household that they have left. So that deprives the household they've departed from of the security that was provided by, by those remittances. They are without the payments that they had been getting previously. They are no longer insulated from the drought. They no longer have that buffer to protect them from the ups and downs and the difficulties of running a farm during a drought. Finally, the absence of those remittance payments also means that the ad hoc community level, farm level adaptation that they may have been planning will have stopped as well. The investment of those remittances in longer term adaptation measures or diversification out of farming will no longer be possible, leaving that rural area, leaving that rural household more vulnerable to climate change impacts in the future as well. So in summary, the key issue here is we've got millions of people who are using internal migration as a survival strategy in the face of climate change impacts like drought. They're surviving by moving into cities to find alternative work. But what coronavirus means is that those urban economies are grinding to a halt and going into lockdown, meaning that potentially millions of people will leave those urban locations and return to extremely climate vulnerable areas in the countryside. One of the key places where this is happening is Bangladesh, and I want to quickly just examine this as a case study. So in Bangladesh at the moment, what we're seeing is many, many people leaving the climate vulnerable delta region of Bangladesh and moving to cities. The delta region is where the Ganges and Brahmaputra rivers flow into the Indian Ocean. It's very, very low lying. It's prone to sea level rise. It also suffers from a number of rapid onset climate driven events like cyclone strikes. It's broadly considered to be one of the most climate vulnerable locations on the planet. It's also an area that has a lot of agriculture, uh, a lot of farming, and those impacts, um, the, the sea level rise and the salination of the farming land that that creates, combined with the cyclone strikes, combined with the flooding and river erosion that takes place, mean that farming in the Delta region is becoming increasingly difficult. And what that means is that many, many thousands of people migrate from the Delta region of Bangladesh 
into the cities that are further inland. And very often that involves migrating from the Delta region to the, to the capital of Bangladesh, to, to Dhaka. It's very often the case that those migrants who have moved from the Delta into Dhaka gain work in the garment industry. They work in factories making clothes primarily for export to wealthier countries. Now, as Dhaka potentially faces going into lockdown in order to prevent the spread of coronavirus, many of those people will be laid off from their jobs working in the garment factories. Similarly, as the high streets of wealthier countries go into lockdown and people stop going out and buying clothes, orders will cease to be placed for the manufacturer of those clothes and people working in the garment industry in Dhaka and in other places across the world will lose their jobs working in those factories. When this happens, those migrants will then face a difficult decision of remaining in Dhaka and trying to find another way to survive or returning to the Delta region of Bangladesh, returning essentially to a location which we know is highly exposed to climate change impacts, cyclone strikes, flash flooding, and various other things that make life there very difficult. What I want to do to finish is look at what some of the options are for mitigating these difficulties. Clearly, the addition of coronavirus into an already complicated mix of migration, displacement and climate change impacts presents some very, very difficult situations. So I'm not proposing here that we have any straightforward answers. Rather, what I want to look at is potential ways that the situation can be eased ever so slightly, that the major risks can be to some extent mitigated and that people's welfare can be protected to the extent that is possible. I don't want to suggest for a second that there are any easy options here. I've broken these options down roughly into three different categories, finance, the protection of rights and continued research. So, so let's begin by looking at finance. I think that an element of debt relief is absolutely essential here. What I think is clear from our understanding of the connections between climate displacement and the spread of coronavirus is that episodes of disaster displacement during the pandemic are inevitably going to be more expensive to deal with. They are going to place an additional burden on the already stretched finances of many of the poorest countries. Now, coping with those disasters is always expensive. It's always expensive for the countries that have to deal with them. But what we can see in the context of the pandemic is firstly that money and scarce resources are going to be deployed in order to pre prevent the spread of coronavirus, leaving less money to deal with disaster displacement. But what we can also see is that dealing with the disaster displacement that does occur during the pandemic will be more costly. It will be more expensive to organize evacuations in a way that try not to increase the spread of coronavirus. It will be more expensive to try to create accommodation in a way that doesn't favor the spread of coronavirus. These things become more complicated, more difficult, and therefore more expensive. And the bulk of that burden will en end up falling on some of the poorest countries on the planet. So my feeling is that debt relief plus increased aid and development money from the richer countries of the world is absolutely essential in helping, in assisting the world's poorest countries deal with this incredibly complex crisis that they are now facing. I think there are several key issues that we need to be aware of, though, when we're thinking about how this potential aid and develop money is deployed. And I think the first thing is that it needs to be, quote, remittance aware. One of the things that we've seen in this session is that there is a really important flow of money from urban economies, from urban centers, into rural areas and that that is helping protect and insulate people and protect the welfare of people who have 
someone from their household who has migrated, right? So the, the support that is made available, if it can be, needs to be aware that one of the key flows that is being disrupted, one of the key flows of money that is, is being interfered with is that flow of remittances from urban to rural areas. And attempts to try and replace that or fill that needs to be thought through. I think it also raises a huge question about how we deploy climate change adaptation funding. What we've seen in this session is that many people are already using rural to urban migration as a way of adapting to and coping with climate change. And secondly, what we're seeing is that the flow of remittances from urban economies into the rural areas, into the countryside, is already being used as a way of financing ad hoc community level climate change adaptation measures. Now, with that money evaporating, with that flow of remittances going, and with that climate adaptation strategy that involves rural to urban migration disappearing, we maybe need to think very carefully about how we adapt climate change adaptation funding in order to try and replace, firstly, the adaptation money that was coming from remittances, but secondly, to help people cope with the fact that migration in this context is now no longer a livelihood strategy option for them in the face of climate change impacts. We also need to think about human rights and how they are protected. One of the key things will be to strengthen and remind governments of their obligations under international law to protect the rights and welfare of internally displaced people and internal migrants. So there are already international frameworks that do this. Key amongst these is the guiding principles on internal displacement. This is a piece of international soft law which is designed to protect the rights and welfare of people who have been displaced within their own country. The aim of it is to create a, quote, refugee-like form of legal protection for people who are moving in their own country rather than crossing an international border. And I think that in the context of the coronavirus pandemic and the displacement which is going on around it, driven by climate change, respecting the guiding principles on internal displacement, reminding states of their obligations under those principles becomes really, really key. I think one of the worrying things that we're seeing as the pandemic unfolds is the potential for human rights essentially to go out the window, for the urgency of coping with the pandemic to become an excuse for failing to respect those rights and failing to abide by the international agreements which governments have signed up for. We need to make sure that governments continue to abide by those principles and continue to respect the rights of people who are displaced by disasters, even as the coronavirus pandemic unfolds around us. Finally, I think we need a new research agenda or an updated research agenda for looking at the connections between climate change and migration. Lots and lots of incredible research has been done to help us firstly understand how climate change and migration are connected. And secondly, to help us understand the experiences and the lives of people who are affected in this way, to understand the experiences and the concerns of people who move. But I think that we're now in a fundamentally different era. Climate change will, of course, continue to drive patterns of migration and displacement, but those, at least for the next few years, will all take place in a wider context of a pandemic. And that has huge implications for how those patterns of migration and displacement unfold. It has huge implications for the individual and collective experiences of migrants and displacees and people who move. So I think we need to update the research agenda in order to take that into account. That draws us to the end of the session. So it just remains for me to thank you all for joining us and remind you that we have more resources available on our website and more videos available on the YouTube channel here. Please sign up to our newsletter and we will keep you updated with further sessions like this and other resources as they become available.